So then Laura Wen. So what is LoRaWAN? Uh, LoRaWAN is a protocol. It's a communications protocol that can be used typically on top of LoRa. And LoRaWAN has uh, different regions. So there is a regional parameters document that I already mentioned a few times, and that describes all the regions where you can use LoRaWAN and all the frequencies to use and what are the limitations uh, and things like that. And you can often find these already implemented uh, in libraries that you can use for end devices uh, and on the network server. Um, but it's just good to know. So there are frequency plans. And uh, for example, in the US, uh, the band is called US 915. Uh, it goes roughly from 902 megahertz to 928 megahertz. And the US 915 is a band where there is a fixed number of channels. Um, it's 64 channels for uplink uh, that are uh, 125 kilohertz in bandwidth. And then there are eight channels that are high-speed channels, uh, 500 kilohertz bandwidth. And then for downlinks, so communication back to the end device, there is another eight channels defined. Uh, so that's just how um, the, the regional parameters uh, define a region, just as an example. What's really uh, important in LoRaWAN is the device classes. And there are three of them. You have uh, class A devices, and class A is implemented by all LoRaWAN devices. And class A is that the end device can initiate uh, a transmission. So the end device can just send a message at any time. Um, this is typically used uh, by devices that are measuring things like sensor nodes, uh, but it can also be devices that on a regular interval they send a heartbeat saying, hey, I'm still here, uh, this is my battery level, uh, and um, I can, uh, I'm, you know, uh, all my sensors are working, for example. Uh, class B is a beaconing. That's uh, basically the, the best way to remember it. And uh, the beacon is sent by the network on a fixed interval uh, by gateways. And the end device can pick up this beacon and wake up to receive a downlink message. So class B devices, they are in deep sleep but they wake up uh, on a time interval. So for example, every half a minute or every two minutes roughly, um, and they listen for traffic from the network. And this is um, not as low power as class A communication, uh, but it allows the network to send a message uh, to the end device, uh, even though the latency is sometimes uh, tens of seconds or, or at most a few minutes. And then finally, class C, uh, which stands for, or is easy to remember, is continuous uh, downlink, uh, means that the um, end device is continuously listening for downlink messages. And this allows the network to send a message to the end device at any time. Um, typically, this uh, is a temporary uh, mode for an end device, so it can be temporarily listening for downlink messages. It can also be that um, it is a end device that is connected to a power source, for example, street lights. Uh, so you can turn them on at any time, and they already have a power source because um, that's the light, uh, so to say. So on the right, you see uh, the difference is class A, B, C, and the main difference is the battery lifetime, uh, with the trade-off being the uh, communications delay. So device classes, uh, this is how it works. There are so-called receive windows. Um, so the end device can send a message. That's what you see here in green. Uh, then there is a RX1 window. So that's the first receive window that's always opened uh, when a device sends a message. Um, it follows by a second receive window. This is exactly one second after the first window. So those are the opportunities that the network always has when an end device sends a message. Um, but with class B, this uh, receive window comes back on an interval. Uh, so that allows the network to send a message uh, every, like I said, every tens of seconds, every half a minute, minute or two minutes, for example. And in class C, um, this uh, window stays open uh, all the time. And when there is a blue window or a yellow window here, the network can send a message to the end device. So some of the limitations. 
Um, the payload size is oftentimes very limited. So uh, depending on the data rate, uh, in, a, in a very low data rate, so a high spreading factor, the um, a limit is typically 51 bytes. If you use a higher data rate, then the limit goes up to 241 bytes. Um, it's highly recommended to use a very smart and simple binary encoding mechanism for payload. Uh, so don't send any text, don't send any JSON, uh, don't certainly not send any XML messages, um, but really be mindful about the, the bits and the bytes that your end device is sending. Um, typically, you would decode those bytes on the server uh, and transform it into a JSON object that makes sense to the application layer. Another limitation is the data rates. So um, the transmission is uh, quite slow. It's up to uh, five and a half uh, kilobits per second. Um, there are different uh, rules in different regions. Um, that can also be a limiting factor when designing LoRaWAN devices. So in the EU, there's a duty cycle. In the US, uh, there are dwell time restrictions. And it also means that the certification program is different for these regions. Uh, finally, um, the communication is asynchronous, so um, your, uh, your gateway is also a device that has to comply with the spectrum regulations. So a gateway also has a duty cycle, and that means that um, a gateway in the EU, for example, uh, is also limited in how many messages it can send. And that means that most of the time, um, the 90% of the traffic, uh, if not more, is uplink, is from the end device towards the network, uh, whereas downlink is typically uh, limited.